Welcome to Under the Lens. Come and enjoy an extraordinary, raw, and unfiltered podcast that delivers debate, discussions, and interviews about film, pop culture, and everything in between. Here is your host, film critic and journalist, Byron Lafayette. Greetings, all. My name is Byron Lafayette, and you are listening to Under the Lens with Byron Lafayette, uh, where we cover entertainment, literature, and everything in between. We do interviews, movie reviews, TV reviews, and we just chat about generally what interests us and hopefully you as well. Uh, Today, I'm very excited to uh, have a special guest with me today for this uh, episode where we're going to be talking about the swashbuckling film, The Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, I've been uh, planning on having this guest uh, on the program for a long time. Uh, we've been uh, talking about like various different uh, different movies and different things to talk about. And uh, we finally settled on uh, doing uh, who was the best Batman. And then I uh, I told him, I said, well, you know what? I'm waiting until Batgirl releases uh, for SEO purposes. <laughs> And obviously, for uh, for reasons which I'm sure everybody knows, uh, that time was never going to come. And so, and so I figured we needed to uh, to do something uh, soon. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Aaron White. And I'm going to let Aaron uh, introduce himself and uh, his podcast. And uh, thanks, Aaron, for uh, for coming on the show. Oh man, thank you. No, I'm I'm hyped. I'm glad that we finally were able to find something to talk about and it's kind of in a roundabout way. It's it's excellent choice because you know, some of the other things are are fun. It would be fun to talk through the Batman. And we can still do that eventually, but this is definitely much more in my personal wheelhouse for what I do. Uh, I have a podcast that has been running about 6 years now called Feel and Film. I'm a member of the Seattle Film Critics Society. I am here in Seattle, uh, the Independent Film Critics of America, a couple of other smaller organizations as well. I just we put out episodes every single week. My best friend and I, we do a deep dive into a movie very similar to what we're going to do here. We kind of try to take more of an emotional perspective than a technical one. We don't get too wrapped up in the weeds of awards and things like that when we do our episodes. And then I also do weekly new release reviews, which I am doing on a spoiler free basis at the moment, uh, just recording those by myself. And then we have other fun content that we, we do movie drafts, uh, we started up a YouTube channel and put our latest movie draft up on that, the video of that. So that was fun. And I'm currently covering the rings of power as well with one of our team members, uh, who is also a huge Lord of the Rings fan. I'm It's my favorite IP, so I'm excited that we have that kind of side project going on. And so I'm, I basically live in the podcasting world uh, in my free time. It's movies and talking about them, or I guess and TV. That that is awesome, and uh, yeah, I was very happy when I heard that uh, that you guys were going to be covering the Rings of Power uh, because you know I've just been enjoying that show so much, and so I need to go back and catch up now on uh, on those episodes because. Uh, weirdly enough, a, a lot of people I, I know actually were not really doing episodes on that. And so I was excited when I was like, oh, you guys are going to cover that. So now launching into our uh, our topic at hand, which is the, the Count of Monte Cristo, uh, we're going to start out by uh, kind of just um, going over a little bit of what our personal experience uh, was with this movie. You know, like when we when we first saw it, uh, you know, just kind of like what feelings did it stir up? Uh, you know, what we liked about it, that kind of stuff. And then, you know, once we uh, once we move on past uh, that, we'll be going on to um, some facts and uh, just kind of breaking down a few different scenes and, and um, things like that. So uh, I'm going to uh, have uh, our guest today uh, start off with uh, his experience. So um, how did this how did this movie affect you? How did you come to find it? When did you first see it? Uh, uh, fill me in on all of that. Well, it's interesting because I absolutely love the swashbuckling genre. I have a soft spot for it. Growing up, there was a, a run of movies that this was kind of one of them, and they all blended together. There was this period of Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and The Three Musketeers, and then this film. And 
several other adaptations that were all just kind of tangential to one another in that swashbuckling way. And then we, we didn't get anything like that for a long time afterwards. And my memory of this was that I was certain I had read the book. I went through a huge kind of French classical literature phase coming out of high school. And I was reading all of Victor Hugo and, and a lot of Alexander Dumas. And I assumed, therefore, that I had read this. I sat down to rewatch this movie back in, I think it was around 2020. And I couldn't remember anything. I, to be honest with you, I don't know that I'd ever seen it <laughs> before that viewing. I it literally was like watching <laughs> something new to me. I think that I got it confused with The Man in the Iron Mask, um, mm -hmm. which feels a lot like this, but obviously totally different story. So I feel like I got to experience it almost brand new just here recently within the last couple of years. And it was amazing. I just getting to kind of go back in time when we got more like this, more, this is a very classical Hollywood adventure. You know, it's got revenge. It's got a love story. It's got mercy and justice as core principles that are being explored. It's got sword fighting, even though there's not nearly as much as you might assume. And it, it's got historical aspects to it. And it really just is a movie that I resonate with because of the ideas that its characters are trying to show us uh, what we learn through, you know, Edmund Dantes and what we get to experience through his POV um, as he's losing everything and then going through this journey of trying to both get it back, but also figure out where he needs to fall between those concepts of justice, mercy, revenge. And so I love it. I think that it is just top to bottom. So, so well made. And Kevin Reynolds in general, who, who is the director and also directed Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, also an absolute favorite movie. I, I think it's just so underrated. That's excellent. You know, I, I have a, you know, very, very similar uh, experience in the sense that I, I love this movie. And, you know, I, I had ended up like I read the book, I, I want to say, when I was probably it was in high school, I believe. Uh, you know, I was I was a, a member of this organization called 4-H. Uh, it was kind of this youth uh, yes. development. Uh, yeah, 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 you know what it is. <laughs> um, and I was a, a member of that. And my, um, my local like kind of district had created this um, this new competition mode for our, our demonstration day that was called dramatic reading. And um, and at the time, I uh, I had been reading uh, Count of Monte Cristo, and I just loved the book. I just I just remember, you know, just you know, I was just couldn't wait to see what was going to happen next on the page. It almost felt like this kind of like a Batman, almost in the sense of, you know, just being this guy who's super wealthy and just you know all the different things he's doing and all the you know machinations that he's doing with it with his plan. And I just I loved it, and I thought, oh, I think I'm going to do a, a a dramatic reading based off of this, and I. I ended up doing <laughs> and I ended up doing the reading on when he escapes uh, Chateau Deef and uh, it was so much fun um, and uh, I had a great time with it I remember the judges all liked it and stuff but that was kind of like my earliest you know like memory of kind of with the book um, and experience with that and I ended up uh, not seeing the movie though for um, for quite some time that uh, I want to say, you know, the film came out in 2002. Um, I want to say I didn't see it until probably the late 2000s. So I, I want to say it was probably around like 2011 or 12 or so. Um, it was when I was in college, I saw it. And, uh, and I remember just kind of thinking like, oh, man, I liked the book. <laughs> I remember thinking like, oh, I've never seen this movie. And, you know, I watched it and I just like fell in love with it. Like I love swashbuckler uh, films as any longtime listener of the podcast or anyone who follows me on social media knows I'm a bit of a fan of the Pirates of the Caribbean uh, franchise. Oh, yes. And <laughs> Aaron knows. And um, and so just like anything with like sword fighting in that era, um, it's just kind of just has this big like romantic feel uh, to it for me. And just I have a soft spot for it. And um 
and yeah, this film was just, it was so well made. It handled so many themes well. And it's one of the rare, rare movies that I say that I view it almost as good as the book, um, that I view it almost on the same level. And, and I say that too, in, in such a, it's such a strange way of saying it because the movie is so different from the book. Like it is, it's almost two different stories in the sense of the way the, the screenwriter had, um, had changed it because I would venture to say the book is almost unfilmable in the sense, cause it's just it, the way it's, it's written, it's not cinematic. And I thought the screenwriter did such a great job that when I watched it, I was like, he captured the spirit of the novel exactly, you know, while also making it into this cinematic experience that was so great. And so I just ended up, I ended up loving it and I revisited it a few times uh, over the years. And then when I watched it again uh, for this podcast, I just was like, oh, it was like even better than I remembered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um you I think know it ages so well and it, to your it point does. about the book mm-hmm. like the book mm-hmm. is obviously lengthy if, mm-hmm. if people who have not like seen it in a physical space it is a big book it is <laughs> yeah. i don't remember how many pages it is but mm-hmm. it's long mm-hmm. and so you know there's so much more character depth and mm-hmm. detail to every location that they go to than you could ever fit into a two two and a half hour movie mm-hmm. and one of the common questions that i think here come up on a lot of podcasts these days is what would this be like, or would this work as a series? And I Mm. feel like this sort of storytelling, much like fantasy, much like a Lord of the Rings really is, would be served well by high production Mm. serial storytelling, because you could split this out over 10 episodes and it would have enough there character wise to provide Oh, easily. there's moments mm-hmm. of intrigue there's the you know the the, the one that ends in revenge the episode mm-hmm. the end, episode that ends in some mercy etc and you could actually film almost a beat for beat you know adaptation that way and there's there's certain genres that i think just really benefit from that structure and this this would be one of them mm-hmm. I absolutely agree because uh, I, I actually thought about that when I was watching the movie. I was like, man, this would be an interesting, you know, TV series. And and I, I really do like the the whole idea of serialized storytelling because, you know, even though I still have a very much of a soft spot for procedural, like, quote unquote, monster of the week, I, I enjoy those, you know, growing up with NCIS and all that kind of stuff. I really do enjoy, you know, being able to take a long form novel or a story and really splitting it up and just going, you know, it's almost reminds me a little bit of uh, the the Bosch novels uh, and how Amazon was able to turn those into fantastic seasons of, of television that were just, you know, you you were hanging on to, you know, the edge of your seat with, you know, every episode. And so I would I would love to see a large budget uh, TV adaptation of The Count of Monte Cristo. I think that would be so interesting uh, to be able to see all of those elements of the novel come out because kind of, as you said, like, you know, the novel itself, it, it doesn't fit into a two hour, two and a half hour movie. It just, it just doesn't work. Um, you would need a lot more time to explore that. So yeah, that would be, that would be very, very interesting. Um, just as a, as a fun question onto that, uh, which, uh, which platform, uh, streaming platform would do you think would be best to handle something like that in your opinion? Like, which would you like to see it on? (laughs) I mean, at at this point, I, I, everything to me needs to go to HBO or Amazon prime. Mm -hmm. Those are the Mm -hmm. two that I believe have the budgets to create the full on worlds that I would like to see. However, as a side pick, cause I feel like that's, they're they're almost a given, Mm -hmm. but of the rest I'm actually a fan of period piece storytelling series that have popped up on what is it? Is AMC Plus? I want to say. Oh, interesting. I think it's AMC uh-huh. Plus. So they've done some stuff that's in this vein. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a tra- I can't even remember some of the shows that I've checked out on there, but there's there's a treasure hunting show, modern day mm-hmm. one that has some sea based elements to it. Um, some kind of almost like Robert Langdon, Da Vinci code Mm -hmm. store, like secrets that are, you know, trying to find a track. It's very Nathan Drake like without the action. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed that quite a bit. And then they've done, I want to say, is it called the North sea maybe, but they've, they've done some things that are, that, that show me that they could handle this 
level of, or this type of setting, because it doesn't need quite the budget that, even though I would like it, I would like everything to have a huge budget <laughs> just because, <laughs> but it doesn't need, like it doesn't have dragons, right? Mm-hmm. You don't have to CGI dragons in, you don't have to make elves and orcs and, and Sauron, et cetera. So you could do this on a lower budget. So I'd say AMC plus. Mm-hmm. Mm, man, that that's a that's a great uh, great suggestion because I've actually not checked out AMC Plus, so I'll have to check that out now. Because uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of like you know some some of the smaller platforms that have done a great job of uh, of doing stuff like um, just off the top of my head. Also, I feel like uh, Stars has done a decent job with some of their Stars. period stuff. Yeah, um, they know. did Spartacus, right? Uh, yes, they did Spartacus, and then the um, Sp- pirate show. Yeah, um, Black Sails. Yeah, Black yeah. Sails. Uh, and um, they uh, have done a series. I've only seen uh, one of them, the uh, Spanish Princess they did. And I think they did the White Queen and some of those other ones. And um, I can't speak to all of them, but I remember the Spanish Princess was pretty decently done, uh, if I remember correctly. Are those in the same adaptation series as uh, the, the other Boleyn Girl? And so I, wanna, I feel like they might be. I don't know. Yeah, I, I have not looked it up, but I've wondered because, yeah, because we have like, you know, they have like the the White Queen. I think they have like the Serpent Queen now, the Spanish Princess. And there was one other one. And I feel like they're all in the same universe. That's what it feels like. <laughs> but I'm not 100 percent sure. I'll have to I'll have to look that up. Um, Aha, yeah, that's, it is. That's a good I question. Yes, it's based uh, on Philippa Gregory's historical novel series, which I, uh, I believe also is uh, what the other Boleyn girl the movie. Yeah. I, I went through a phase. Mm-hmm. I, I've loved this sort of period type mm-hmm. stuff. One of my favorite shows of all time was the Tudors for that reason. And I liked Rome back in the day. There's a, a series called Rome on HBO that ran for a couple of seasons. So yeah, anything in this kind of era and style is, mm. is really fun. Well, going into, uh, you know, kind of the brief film overview uh, of this, um, The Count of Monte Cristo was released in uh, the year 2002. It was uh, directed by Kevin Reynolds, um, as Aaron said, who also did uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, which is a great, uh, great movie. Uh, It was written by uh, Jay uh, Walpert. um, And there's actually some interesting facts about him that we're going to talk about a little bit later um, that just make him as the screenwriter even more interesting. Uh, it starred uh, Jim Caviezel in the uh, lead role, and uh, a lot of you may recognize him as obviously playing Jesus Christ in The Passion of the Christ. Um, and yeah, he was also in a, a, a fairly decent uh, s- uh, science fiction show called Person of Interest. Um, it also uh, starred Guy Pierce, uh, Richard Harris, uh, Henry Cavill, and Luis Guzman. Uh, the music was composed by uh, Edward Shearmer. I want to say, I believe that's how it's pronounced. And the cinematography was by uh, Andrew Dunn. And the synopsis uh, for the film, um, as uh, stated by IMDb, uh, is very simple. A young man falsely imprisoned by a jealous friend escapes and uses a hidden treasure to exact revenge. Uh, very, uh, very simple, but exactly what the movie is about. Uh, the tagline uh, for this movie was uh, prepare for adventure, count on revenge. Uh, so they, uh, they definitely liked their puns there. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was a uh, rated PG 13. Uh, it's runtime was two hours and 11 minutes and it's box office. Uh, it earned a worldwide total of 75.4 million. And uh, that was on an estimated budget of 35 million. So, uh, so the film was a modest success. Uh, it wasn't a, uh, a massive hit, uh, but it definitely didn't lose money at the box office. And also, interestingly enough, I did a little bit of research, but I wasn't able to find any. Uh, I was curious to see what the rental and like uh, physical media sales were because, you know, this was released at the time when, you know, obviously we still had Blockbuster, we still had Hollywood Video, um, and DVD sales were really high at this point. And so I suspect this film probably did very well on physical media, but I wasn't able to find any uh, um, any stats on uh, on uh, numbers.com for that. Well, it's not uh, really available now. I can tell you that. I, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I, went, I went to buy it. I, mm-hmm. When I rewatched it 
for the podcast. I was like, you know what? This I need to own this. Look, mm-hmm. Surely there's like a nice 4K or mm-hmm. if there's not, you know, it's got to be a bl- Blu-ray with mm-hmm. some special feature. No, mm-hmm. doesn't exist. I was mm-hmm. very upset. Yeah, it is very, very hard. I was able to track down a Blu-ray copy, like an old Blu-ray copy of it. Um, okay. And definitely, like, I'll see if I can find the link to send it to you, uh, because, um, because yeah, it's definitely worth getting because it looks good, and also it has a bunch of special features on oh, it. Oh, okay, they well, that's what it, I want. It's super yeah. fun, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Like, it's it's not like terribly long, but I want to say like the making of was like probably a good forty minutes at least, and it was it was really interesting, like interview with the screenwriter and stuff. So yeah, I'll I'll see if I can find you the link of where I bought it and send it to you because it's definitely definitely worth it. Uh, so the critical reception on uh, Rotten Tomatoes uh, was a uh, 73% a positive critic rating and an 88% positive audience rating. Uh, so this was one of those few movies that actually uh, was pretty much well received by everyone. Uh, and the uh, critical consensus uh, came out saying, um, though it may not reach for any new artistic heights, The Count of Monte Cristo is an old fashioned yet enjoyable swashbuckler. And uh, I definitely enjoy it's very, very enjoyable. Um, you know, I, I would take a little bit of a, a little bit um, uh, of point when they say, like, it doesn't reach any new artistic heights, because I, I do think actually the film artistically was very was very good. Uh, but we'll get into that a little bit, uh, a little bit more. So now uh, moving on here to uh, some fun facts. Uh, and we'll talk about some of these. Um, uh, were you aware, Aaron? uh when you like went in to like watch this movie that there, that this was the 17th adaptation of the book. That's insane. No, absolutely (laughs) not. I mean, there shouldn't be 17 adaptations of anything. I don't even know if there are 17 adaptations of Batman. Okay. Like that's crazy. I, know, I I was you know because I I honestly thought when I when I was doing the research I was like I know there was one back in like 1935 or something like that right you know one of those like Douglas <laughs> Fairbanks type ones and then Absolutely. when I looked it up I was like wait 17 of these goodness <laughs> like, gracious oh because I I agree with you there should be there should not be that many adaptations for anything um, <laughs> that is just way way too much um now the screenwriter uh, Jay Wolpert. Uh, weirdly enough, was actually a winner on uh, the game show Jeopardy uh, back in the 70s. And he also was a longtime producer for The Price is Right. Um, And yeah, like I was very surprised by that because like, you know, (laughs) when you think of like a game show producer and somebody who spent their whole career producing game shows, you don't really think The Count of Monte Cristo. (laughs) No, totally different vibe. Uh huh. Yeah, like totally different. Um, now, funny enough, what I learned was uh, that um, at uh, I believe it was um, at one point in his life as a producer, uh, he actually had an intern um, who a lot of people may recognize the name Nancy Myers. Uh, she, you know, is uh, famous for a lot of like romantic comedies and like romantic dramas and stuff. Um, some some great uh, films that she's she's made. And uh, um, the story went that uh, he kind of he said he ran into her uh, over the course of 20 years, you know, and they would like, you know, they talk and everything. And he said that he ran into her one day uh, at um, at lunch and they were talking and he said that she just kind of out of the blue just said, how come you never wrote? And he kind of didn't really know. And he said he just kind of started dabbling a little bit. And uh, ended up that the County Monte Cri- Count of Monte Cristo was his first script that he ended up selling to Disney. Wow. Uh, which I thought was just, you know, very, very interesting. Um, and then also what um, a lot of people may not also know, uh, and this goes into my other swashbuckling interest, uh, is that um, he actually wrote the first script for Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. Um, wow. Yeah, that's, and like yeah. that's like pretty. Yeah, like it, it kind of goes when you see like the work he did on like Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, definitely. Uh, yeah, like it's it's definitely he had that kind of that that touch and that feel. Um, now it ended up that he did not get screenwriting credit uh, for the Pirates film, uh, even though he created most of the characters uh, and you know the plot line and everything. That it ended up going through a bunch of rewrites. Uh, with I want to say they said it went through like three or four other writers. And so he ended up only getting a story uh, screen story credit um, 
which, uh, you know, it's anyone who knows the business knows that, you know, when things go through rewrites, you know, <laughs> you don't always get the, get the credit that, uh, that, uh, you may think you deserve or even possibly do, do deserve. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, what do you, what do you think about that with him? Like going from, you know, like the price is right to this type of, of storytelling. I mean, the only thing I could even say is talented people tend to be talented and find a way to express that in multiple different ways. Mm -hmm. And so it's not surprising to me in that regard that someone who is smart enough to win Jeopardy, (laughs) you know, and talented enough to write a movie like The Count of Monte Cristo as a first screenplay would be able to successfully produce a one of the most, if not, you know, right there with Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune is the three most recognizable, long running, most successful game shows really in the history of TV. Mm-hmm. And so and so that makes kind of sense, sort of. Mm-hmm. It's the, the closest we can get to making sense of it. And it's <laughs> yeah. really weird. The the Pirates thing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a bummer. It's too bad mm-hmm. that he didn't get more noted credit outwardly for that because they are so much just almost i mean they just live in the same type of story world i would wonder what the screen write or what the edits looked like because my guess is having you know the count of monte cristo as a reference that it's probably likely that more of the jokes came Mm -hmm. later because Mm -hmm. count of monte cristo has some wonderful comedy to it but it's not comedy it's it's lines that are funny because they're ironic or, mm-hmm. you know, the things that happen in the film then make a, a certain line of dialogue kind of funny in hindsight or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. not jokes for the sake of it's, it's a little different than the tone mm-hmm. of pirates. And so my, my, my question would be is I wonder if that's what got added up into it later. I wondered the same thing. Yeah. And it, it could be also maybe some of the more supernatural elements maybe were added a little bit later, you know, maybe his story was a little bit more, uh, um, a little bit more pirate focused, possibly who knows, but I, I definitely agree. Cause yeah, the humor is there in count of Monte Cristo, but like you said, it's not, uh, it's not the same type of humor. You know, uh, I always think of, uh, Luis Guzman's character, you know, when it, when he's like, well, are we going to spend the money? And he's like, no, he's like, I need revenge. And he's like, okay, I will go and kill them myself. And then we'll spend the money. <laughs> you know, it's like, there's, there's some great, uh, great interactions there, but so the next uh, interesting fact about this uh, movie was the lead, uh, Jim Caviezel and uh, um, Henry Cavill were both uh, in, obviously, this this uh, this movie. Henry Cavill plays his son. And uh, kind of just a weird uh, kind of twist was that uh, both of them were actually uh, considered for the role of Superman. Uh, Jim Caviezel um, was actually uh, one of the top picks for um, Brian Singer's uh, Superman Returns in 2006. And Henry Cavill actually was uh, considered for that as well. So it's kind of interesting that both of them, uh, both of them were reviewed for that. Cavill, of course, uh, went on to be cast as a Superman in Man of Steel and followed that up in Batman versus Superman and Justice League. And who knows? He might be in Black Adam. We don't know. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, wh- uh, what do you think, Aaron, of, uh, of Jim Caviezel as Superman? Like, can you see that or, or uh, are you not able to see that? It's really hard for me to see or not see people as superheroes. I'll be honest because I am a pretty forgiving film critic or fan both. Just when I watch movies, I tend to like more than I don't and accept more than I don't. And I think most actors, you know, are able to pull things off to some, to some extent. And I like most of the Supermans we've had. And I like, Mm -hmm. You know, I like the different Batmans that we've had. I, I don't like the fights as much because mm-hmm. I can see value in all of them. And they, they all tend to fit in their own worlds mm-hmm. for the most part. Not mm-hmm. not always. Mm-hmm. I, I think Jim Caviezel is a phenomenal actor. Mm-hmm. And if you gave him the right Superman movie, mm-hmm. he could be awesome. Mm-hmm. I really I do think that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it would have to be a much more serious Mm -hmm. Superman movie. Mm -hmm. Like I could see him, you know, in 
more of a, a Zack Snyder mm-hmm. type of Superman role than I could ever see him in some of the stuff that came before. Just the more campy you get, the more lighthearted and comic book, you know, I, I don't know, light lightness to it. He just he's not going to thrive in that. But if, when you're in, in the darker exploration of the character, the serious aspects of him that he's wrestling with. Mm-hmm. Uh, with his own identity and stuff like that's the part where I think he would be able to, to do really well. Definitely. Definitely agree. Yeah. Cause I, I definitely was having some trouble viewing him almost in like the Superman returns a little bit, but like you said, yeah, like no almost like a man of steel style or even like I saw an article where somebody mentioned they were like, you know, um, they're like, even now they're like, they should cast him for an Elseworlds version of like, um, kingdom come. And I was like, Oh yeah. Kingdom come, you know, like style Superman with him would be awesome. So I, I definitely agree. Um, so now talking about a, a little bit of a, uh, of a fun fact with a, a particular scene, uh, in the film, uh, that there is a scene where one of the villains of the film, uh, via fort, uh, is basically disgraced. His crimes are found out. And uh, he is on his way to prison. And when he gets into the wagon, he sees there's a gun next to him. And uh, basically that there was two versions of this scene. uh, And um, the first scene basically was he goes, he sticks the gun in his mouth. He pulls the trigger and it clicks. And then you see the count come over the window and say, uh, did you think that I would make that make it easy for you or some variation of that? It was a fantastic scene. Um, but uh, there was actually another version that uh, the director, Kevin Reynolds, uh, did one where the gun was loaded and he actually kills himself. And the director felt that that actually worked better. And he had that in the original cut. However, um, according to um, some of the sources with test audiences, Uh, who didn't have any knowledge of the existing footage of him not uh, killing himself, they felt that it was better if the gun was not loaded. Um, And they they preferred that version of the scene. I'm assuming there was probably some questions asked. And so it ended up that uh, they added the uh, previous scene in. Uh, So like, Erin, which version of that scene uh, would you prefer? Uh, Do you think the one in the theatrical was was the best? Or do you think that uh, that alternate scene is better? Well, you already know my answer because I immediately messaged you literally <laughs> yeah. when I was rewatching the movie and I was like, dude, or maybe I posted on Facebook something. We talked about it somewhere mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when it happened, when I saw it, because I absolutely love the way that it ended up in the theatrical version. I was waiting for the death and for it not to come and to get that zinger. I just think it is so much more in line with the wonderful, wonderful, just dark quote that Edmund says to Jacques, uh, Jacopo when he says, what do you want to buy? And he says, revenge. Mm -hmm. And then he says, death is too good for them. Mm -hmm. They suffer as I suffered. They must see their world. All they hold dear ripped from them as it was ripped from me. And to me, this is what has to happen for you to reach that level for this character, right? Like, I mean, there's different ends that each of the the villainous characters meets, but you need, it, it couldn't be easy. It has to be extra painful. And, and he's mm. not getting the equivalent. He's not getting all they hold dear is not being ripped away from him. If he's just allowed to, you know, depart his existence on earth. Now he has to go suffer the shame of the fall from grace, the fall from being this important leader with all of this money and wealth and prestige and this important father. And his whole family is going to be called into question. He's going to be arrested. He's going to go to prison. Like it is a much, much worse fate. And to do it in a way that taunts him, it, I man, I just, I, it's one of my favorite top five scenes in the whole movie. I just absolutely love it. I definitely agree with you. I, I think it was it was a fantastic scene. It goes very well with the quote, you know, of what uh, Edmund says earlier, um, and also uh, what uh, what I really like is that I kind of like the the duality a little bit of that the fear that uh, Viafort had with his father being a Bonapartist. And that he was scared of like, oh, I'm going to be put in prison. Oh, you know, shame is going to come down my family. All of that ended up happening to him because of what he did. And I just thought it was just it was just poetically brilliant, I think. 
Now, let's see. So one of the uh, one of the other interesting interesting facts, and I think this kind of stuff does happen uh, happen on a. Uh, on movies occasionally is that during um, one of the fencing scenes between uh, Jim Caviezel and uh, Guy Pierce, uh, apparently a move was performed incorrectly and Pierce was accidentally stabbed in the side. Uh, and he ended up being taken to the hospital. He was okay. He was patched up and um, yeah. And like, and reportedly he was bragging about the wound proudly that it was like, a, you know, it was like, okay, you know, he got this from like working hard in the film. And I guess like Caviezel just felt terrible, I guess, <laughs> you know, about it. Um, but that, uh, yeah, that seems very consistent with both of their personas just in general mm-hmm. as human beings in general, mm-hmm. you know, like I, I love Guy Pierce. I loved see, being able to see him here. I, I, one of my first thoughts was, man, why is this guy not in more movies? Because mm-hmm. I miss the Guy Pierce era. He, Me too. Mm-hmm. he chews it up in this movie um, so well. And and the sword fight, that's a it, it's not surprising to me. Like I, I wrote down a note that said, seriously, sword fighting looks so painful. So there mm-hmm. we go. <laughs> you know, like I just can't imagine living in a time where this was how you settled your differences. Like, no, mm-hmm. thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, I would I mean, I'd rather just be shot by a sniper across yeah. the <laughs> and not know it happened. This mm-hmm. is crazy. Mm hmm. Uh, it, it is absolutely true because yeah because like you know sword fighting on on its own is 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 so it's it, it's very personal it's very uh you know it's 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 up close and i you know i can uh there was um there was a bit of a of a um, in the special features kind of about how they filmed you know the sword fights and and just the incredible amount of training that they had to go through and just like you know and how the one duel, you know, the final duel at the end of the film, how it took them, you know, almost a month of training basically in order to do that. And, uh, and the, um, the, the fencing expert said, you know, basically he said, Oh, he said, I always get a little worried, you know, when they go to start filming it, because he said, they're so good at what they're doing. They've been practicing for so long. He's like, that that's when things go wrong. (laughs) Um, and uh, and of course, you know, obviously something did did uh, did go wrong a bit in the sense that he uh, he stabbed him in the side. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic fencing scene. Um, and I'm sure we'll probably talk about that a little bit later with uh, with some of our, our scene uh, analysis. And uh, our final fun fact here uh, was that um, the screenwriter, uh, Jay Wolpert, actually uh, came up with an idea that was not present in the novel. Uh, and that was that, uh, Fernanda Montega, uh, which is a uh, Guy Pierce's character and Edmund Dantes, uh, started out as best friends, uh, as childhood friends. Uh, and that wasn't that way in the book. Um, but his logic was that he felt it worked better as a buddy film that then turned sinister, um, because he said that he believed that when a friendship soured, um, the hate that was generated from that would end up being way more terrible and way more believable than just two enemies who didn't exactly know each other and were just brought together by circumstance. Um, and so uh, do you, uh, do you agree with him there? Do you think that that was a, a good element to add to the story? I do. And it actually bleeds into something I thought about when watching it. And it was a question I kept coming back to of they are, shown to us in the beginning and and it's it's kind of told to us because we don't get to see too much of them before things go south and we're led to believe obviously that they are close friends and yet the jealousy that leads fernand to this extreme betrayal makes me question the friendship in the first place (laughs) like retroactively I wonder, like, were you ever friends? And can you really call yourself that if this whole time you were so consumed with jealousy and you were so, well, I guess he wasn't consumed with it the whole time. He was fine when Edmund was just the son of a a clerk or whatever, because that's what he says. He says, because you're the son of a clerk and I'm not supposed to want to be you. That's Fernand's reasoning for why he betrays him. It's all about envy and this belief that they can be best friends as long as I'm the man of higher station. And I just question, you know, is that really a friendship at all? So I I love it because it makes me think about that. And I wouldn't even have that aspect of the film to confront if this wasn't a choice that got made. And I I do think that it adds a ton. I I actually can't even imagine this. I I didn't read the book, you know, because I thought I had, but I didn't. And I can't imagine it having the same effect if 
they didn't have a relationship like this prior. No, I definitely, I definitely agree. I think it, it strengthened uh, the narrative, and uh, and like you said, I kind of also called into question of like you said, were they ever really friends? You know, in the first place, because you know that that envy, you know that uh, that he had, you know, for Edmond, you know, and like what uh, uh, what Mercedes, you know, kind of says about how you were so, you know, that the one summer or something like that, you know, he's like where you got a pony and Edmond got a, a whistle. And then she says, and you were so angry that he was more happy with his whistle than you were with your horse. And, and it was just, it was such an interesting character dynamic for him of, of that. He was so jealous of the life that Edmund had, even though it was so much poorer, it was so much less grand than what he had. And I, it was a great foundation, I think for that, for that rivalry and that betrayal that ended up coming and, uh, and I think, you know, it, it just, it added so much more pain, you know, because, you know, Edmund was so guileless, really, you know, he was a nice guy, you know, um, he was almost a little bit, he was almost naive in some ways, uh, you can say, you know, with, with trusting people, uh, he trusted Napoleon, you know, and he trusted Viafort and he trusted his friend. And then, you know, everything, everything was turned on him. And then we get to see him kind of go a little bit more into that jaded side, you know, before he comes back around at the end. So now we're going to move on to a uh, to a, a section uh, of our review uh, called uh, uh, "Quotes That Stuck With Us," and uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the various quotes um, that uh, the film has because it has a lot of good quotes in it. <laughs> it has a lot of a lot of great uh, uh, interactions with characters. So we're going to talk about a few of them, kind of uh, what our thoughts uh, were on them. So the first one that uh, that we're going to uh, to start with uh, is um, is a moment with uh, Edmond Dantes where he gives a toast uh, for um, his. At that point, he doesn't know it's his son, um, but his son's uh, 16th uh, birthday party, and um, and kind of a little bit of a background for for anybody who may not have seen the movie with listening to this. Um, can't imagine why you would be listening to it though if you hadn't seen the film. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank um, you. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, de- yeah, definitely. You're Thank welcome you for, here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the, for the listens. But then, uh, after it's over, go watch the movie, um, <laughs> that, uh, basically, you know, um, uh, um, that, uh, Guy Pierce's character is this kind of like absent father who doesn't really like his, his, uh, his son or his non son, I guess you could say. And, uh, he basically just ignores him and doesn't go to down to give the toast, which would have been horribly humiliating in front of all of their friends. And, uh, his mother Mercedes is going to give the, uh, the toast for him, but then Edmund jumps in to basically save the day and save his dignity. And he gives this great quote uh, where he says, life is a storm, my young friend. You will bask in the sunlight one moment, be shattered on the rocks the next. What makes you a man is what you do when that storm comes. You must look into that storm and shout as you did in Rome, do your worst for I will do mine. Then the fates will know you as we know you as Albert, Mo- as Albert Montego, the man. This is a great quote. Um and uh, what what did you think? What did you think of that? Uh, that Aaron? Well, so one thing that I I'm trying to remember: Does he know yet at this point? I, I don't think he knows that Albert is his son. Correct. He does not know. Mm-hmm. So I I ve- I'm going to be a, somewhat cynical in my view of this. It is a phenomenal quote in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. Like, and I and I love the dialogue and the script of this entire. Mm-hmm movie i think that is one of the things that makes it so so great i think he largely is not saying all of this in a way that is intended to necessarily save the day for albert i think he is prepping him for the eventual capture the eventual kidnapping and he is trying to kind of quietly influence (laughs) this young (laughs) kid's reactions Mm -hmm. so that he will eventually fight against his own dad. Like he is trying to Mm -hmm. sow discord within this family. Oh, 100%. Uh And so, so that's my, Mm -hmm. so I'm glad that, okay, good. It's not just me being cynical then it is how it's meant to be. (laughs) 
because I definitely feel that it's like mm-hmm. it's almost like a, a dual purpose, right? That's mm-hmm. one side of it, and the other side is him being able to outwardly express secretly through this quote directed at Albert how he is feeling in his mm-hmm. emotional state because this is what he obviously went through and what he has done. And so, yeah, super powerful mm-hmm. and, and phenomenal, like toast mm-hmm. scene. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And, and I, I definitely agree, agree with you that, that at that moment it is, it's not meant to be a, uh, a, a fully philanthropic quote, <laughs> you know, um, he's telling a little bit of almost like his life story in the sense of, you know, that he was basking in the, in the sunlight, then he was shattered on the rocks. And, you know, and like you said, he's basically kind of saying, you know, that this is going to happen to you. Basically, I'm going to you know, your life is going to be destroyed basically, you know, um, and, you know, and hopefully, hopefully you'll get through it, you know? (laughs) Um, so the, uh, the next quote is actually, you know, one that is probably my, my favorite, I think, uh, in the, uh, in the film. And it's a, it's an interaction between, uh, Edmond Dantes and, uh, the prisoner who he meets in, uh, Chateau d'If. And, uh, it's, a uh, um, uh, uh, let's see. It's Abba. Um, let's see. Abba for Fer- Ab- Yes, Faria. There we go. I was trying to figure out how to not butcher that. <laughs> you know? um, and where uh, Abba, he says, um, here is your final lesson. He says, do not commit the crime for which you now serve the sentence. God said, vengeance is mine. Edmund then says, um, I don't believe in God. And uh, he replies, well, it doesn't matter. He believes in you. And it was it was a, a quote that I really I really liked in the film. It goes great with the with the with the moment and kind of that duality of showing kind of who the two characters were at that moment. And just a little bit of background for this quote for uh, for people who may not know that, you know, Ed- Edmund is somebody who does believe in God in the beginning of the film. Uh, and um, and he even says at one point where he's being beaten by the by the uh, by the warden. Uh, you know, he says that, you know, um, that God is everywhere. He sees everything and he believes that God is going to give him justice. And when the warden basically starts to beat him and says, well, you know, basically, uh, let's make a bargain. He said, ask God for help and I'll stop when he comes down and, and saves you. And obviously he's not saved and he loses his faith. And so this this quote, I think, is is really good because it kind of adds. I don't know. It kind of adds almost that little bit of a seed in him that all hope is not lost and that, you know, God is still there, even if he doesn't believe in him. And so uh, did you, did you like that quote? Did you think that it worked in that, in that moment in the film? Best quote in the movie. It's (laughs) so uh, oftentimes I will lead my letterboxd reviews with a quote, Mm -hmm. like a favorite Mm -hmm. quote from a film. And that's the one that I wrote at the top of this one, because it's the thing that stuck out to me. It is the whole synthesis of the entire film like boiled down into a single two sentences in my opinion mm-hmm. um this is a movie, like you said you you express it all perfectly going through that whole section i, I love that quote from uh, dorliac mm-hmm. I, I love how that works where he's like yeah, let's make a bargain you mm-hmm. know i'll stop when god shows up the moment he shows up it's just such a crushing when he says that you just know that you're watching this mm-hmm. and you're just like this guy truly believes like he's going to get through this. And, and this is one of the strengths of the film is the way it shows the progression of the years and how it wears him down. Mm -hmm. And like you said, he, you know, carves, God will give me justice on the cell wall. And he tries to cling to that. And, And that is what this is all about is like clinging to these values or this faith that you have. And in the midst of, extreme persecution and things that are going horribly in your life. And in this case, out of your control, Mm -hmm. where will you go? What will you end up with? And I think it's gotta be the reason that Caviezel ends up getting cast as Jesus. I will not believe otherwise (laughs) because to me, this whole section in the tower, like, or in the, Mm -hmm. in the um, prison, it's like, it is Jesus. You can, you can put him there, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so, yeah, I, I just think this is, it's so just wonderful. Like both of those performances, the way the lines are delivered, it, it's wonderful. Um, and it, it really does stick with you, especially if you're a person of faith yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know I've, I am, and mm-hmm. I have gone through those periods where I don't know that I would ever say I didn't believe in God, but I've questioned things mm-hmm. and, 
just the simple response of he believes in you, like a reminder that like, it doesn't matter if you, you know, like it, it does matter, but ultimately he, in the character's minds, like God is going to exist and he, he believes you can do things that even you don't yet fully believe you can do. And it's just super inspiring and optimistic. And I, I definitely agree. And I, th- I think, uh, I think what you just said is, is just a perfect, you know, uh, summing it up of, of where you said that, that he, he believes in you being able to, to do things that you don't, you don't realize you are capable of, you know, and it, it is, it is so true, you know, because obviously, you know, when, when we go through, you know, bad things, you know, and as you said, you know, I've definitely gone through, through my own share, you know, you, you're, you're only seeing kind of, you know, it's, it's almost like you have glasses on that are just completely blank, you know, just completely blacked out. And so you're only seeing what's right in front of you and you just don't, you don't see any way out of it. And it was kind of like with, with Edmund, you know, that it was just kind of like, you know, he, he was done, you know, and is I agree with you. It's just a totally, totally powerful, powerful quote. And I think it sums up the movie and it is my favorite as well. Uh, and I think that, um, um, well, you know what, we'll, we'll go on to one, uh, we'll jump down to the other quote first and talk about that one. And then we'll go back to the last one. Cause I think the last one kind of is a, is a good, uh, a good, uh, uh, point to finish the quote section up on. But, um, you know, we, we mentioned already a little bit, the, the, uh, warden, uh, Dorliac, who's just a, a horribly evil person. <laughs> you know, It's like, you know, and, um, he reminds me a lot of, a lot of ways of the, there's a, a term. It was, it was used by a journalist when she was covering, uh, elements, uh, um, some of the, um, Holocaust trials, uh, where she said she called it the banality of evil hmm. and, you know, and basically just kind of saying that these, that some of these people were, not necessarily the monstrous mustache twirling villains that you necessarily expected. They were just kind of the everyday bureaucratic evil, you know, committing horrible acts. And Dorliac to me just kind of perfectly sums that up, you know, that he's just a guy doing his job and he just likes being a bad guy <laughs> and, and causing pain and torment to people in his everyday bureaucratic job. And Kevin and- Riddles, <laughs> it, it was so smart for casting Michael Wincott. So Michael Wincott is, you know, not had many memorable roles, but the two he had this and guy of Gisborne in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves are Mm -hmm. so adjacent to each other. Like they are the same character and (laughs) it's brilliant. And he is as good as anybody could be at this, like in this single small character role, he is like an A plus Mm -hmm. doing both of them. And I, I think because of what he did in Robin Hood is why Kevin Reynolds was like, no, you're obviously the guy for this. And he was <laughs> so right. I de- definitely agree because like, even though he has limited screen time, I mean, he, he completely squeezes that role for all it's worth, you know, and, and he pulls every bit out of it and just creates a very memorable villain, uh, you know, for one who probably only has about maybe five minutes of screen time total. Um, it's a, it's a, a great one. And he has this one quote where it's near the beginning where, um, uh, where Edmund meets him for the first time. And he, and he says, basically, I know you must hear this all the time, but I'm innocent. And Dorliac replies and he says, well, my dear Dantes, I know perfectly well that you are innocent. Uh, why else would you be here? If you were truly guilty, there are a hundred prisons in France where they would lock you away. But Chateau Deef is where they put the ones they're ashamed of. Oh, so good. Oh, the yeah, this is so good. <laughs> it's <is> so good. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like that quote. It was just it was so it was so interesting. And it was just such a great look at, at a lot of times how governments work, you know, and mm-hmm. especially corrupt governments, you know. Well, I feel like that's when you you start to get really broken right mm-hmm. there. And that at least that's when I feel it as a viewer mm-hmm. for Dante. Is I'm like, oh, you know, if he's if if they're so open about it that he can just mm-hmm. outwardly tell him that straight up to his face, like you know that mm-hmm. he's to- he's toast. Like he's not mm-hmm. getting out, and that's that's the intent, right? Is mm-hmm. to create despair, to create a lack of hope in these prisoners, mm-hmm. and then like beyond that, to be sadistic and punish them <laughs> for for pure pleasure, mm-hmm. which is completely unnecessary. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, it is. The delivery of it is phenomenal. And again, just the writing is so descriptive and pitch perfect. Mm-hmm. 
it, it absolutely is. And it, you know, and it made me wonder a little bit just with, you know, some subtext, because sometimes I, I like to look at subtext and read between the lines of, of characters in, in films. And it, and it made me wonder almost, uh, you know, and I would have loved to have been able to ask the, the screenwriter while he was still with us, you know, if he intended this or not. But it's like, it almost kind of felt like Dorliac himself was, was almost written as almost a prisoner himself in the sense that like, for some reason he was sent to Chateau Deef as a punishment that it wasn't, this was not the, the prestige warden position that everybody wants, but it was like, you know, that uh, it almost seemed like he, he was sent away for something as a punishment to that place. And then was taking out all of, all of that, all of that uh, despair and anger that he had himself on everybody else. So like, that's just reading between the lines a little bit, but it, but it made me wonder if that was an intention of the screenwriter or not. All right. So going on to our final quote here, and I think that this, uh, this kind of like, it's near the end of the film and it kind of, you know, wraps up some of uh, what we've already been uh, talking about quote rise where, um, where Edmund basically he's, he's finished his path of uh, vengeance. He's, he's basically, he's gotten his family back uh, again. All of the uh, evildoers have, uh, have gotten their com- comeuppance and it ends with, uh, with him and everybody he loves on uh, Chateau Deef where he's purchased the, uh, the island for himself. And he ends up, he says, he looks out on the ocean and he says, uh, you were right, priest, you were right. This I promise you and to God, all that was you, all that was once used for vengeance will now be used for good. So rest in peace now, my friend. And it was, it was a really interesting quote because I think that, you know, for, for me, and I think probably for some other people, uh, one thing that I, I, when I first watched the film that I, that I thought was, well, you know you know, the, the script is giving him warnings kind of, of don't go down the path of revenge. Don't, you know, don't become the man who you're not supposed to and stuff. And at first I was kind of like, Oh, well, we don't see a lot of consequences of him committing these vengeance acts. It's like, it's not like he loses people or loses his love or anything like that. Um, but I felt like it was interesting because this quote to me kind of showcased that, it wasn't so much that he was losing physically what, you know, he wasn't losing uh, his physical world from the revenge, but he was losing his soul basically. And he was, it was being chipped away at. And that I got the feeling from this quote that it was like, he was completely, he, he was hollow and empty from the revenge. He didn't get the, he didn't get the, the, the satisfaction that he was hoping to feel from it. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if you felt the same way or not, but that's what I kind of felt from, from this quote where he decides to turn, turn away from the bitterness and not allow it to, to run his life anymore. Yeah. I mean, I think it just is indicative of the impact that, you know, Ferreira had on him and in even getting him to this point. I don't think that, Faria would have ever approved of what Dante's did, honestly, in the path he took. You know, I think he shows us a character that would have wanted him to take the high road from the very start once he was out, you know. Um, And I think this is his way of sort of almost apologizing for that, Mm -hmm. in a sense, but also trying to honor the help that he gave Dante's. And not just that, I mean it's so much more than just helping him escape and getting him motivated and, and kind of helping to renew his hope. We have to remember he was an illiterate man, Dante's like, that is the whole reason that he's in this situation is because he couldn't read and write. He was just very uneducated. And so they were able to take advantage of him Mm -hmm. and Faria like teaches him about, about the world. He teaches him, so so much to the point where he is able to then go and like take on this whole new persona as a count and nobody questions him because he has this knowledge and and he has the ability to put himself out as if he'd always been that way and so he he owes so much of like who he is now to this one man that yeah i think it's it's kind of like it's almost like getting saved Honestly, Mm -hmm. it's it's almost like it's almost like he's making a decision. He's like, you know what? I have lived for me and 
I've accomplished the things I wanted to accomplish and I'm still finding myself a little empty and wanting. And so now, you know, in a Christian faith, like I'm going to commit my life to Christ. So therefore I am going to live differently. And that feels like that's essentially what he is proclaiming here, which is an honor honorific to Abe Faraya because that's, you know, obviously he's a priest. Like that's mm-hmm. how he lives his life as well. No, definitely. I, I a hundred percent agree. And I think that that was a great, that was, a, that was a, um, that was a great example that you used that it was almost like a salvation moment, you know, uh, that, you know, he was, he was going to, he was going to be the man who Fry believed him to be, you know, inside. And he decided to do that. Uh, uh, very, very good. So now moving into our, our, uh, our final section, uh, for, uh, for this, uh, review is a, a section called under the lens. And uh, basically, this is where we kind of look at a few moments uh, from the film uh, that we enjoyed and that we thought uh, uh, basically propped the film up in a lot of ways and uh, that we felt stood out. Um, so uh, the first thing we're going to uh, do, and I'm going to toss it over to our, to our guest, is that um, how, um, how would you sum up uh, this movie in a few sentences? Like if, if somebody you know, was asking you, hey, what do you think about this movie? What, what is it? How, how would you sum that up to them? I'm going to cheat. and instead of tooting my own horn by coming up with something really smart i'm actually going to read you roger ebert's quote which is a couple of sentences Mm -hmm. that i don't think i could ever say it better Mm -hmm. than him and he is the goat of film Mm -hmm. criticism so i do often agree with him and i do often (laughs) revert back to like seeing what he said about a movie um, regardless of whether our opinions match but he had this to say the count of monte cristo is a movie that incorporates piracy Napoleon in exile, betrayal, solitary confinement, secret messages, escape tunnels, swashbuckling, comic relief, a treasure map, Parisian high society, and sweet revenge. And it brings it in at under two hours. With performances by good actors who are clearly having fun. This is the kind of adventure picture the studios churned out in the golden age. So traditional, it almost feels new. And I think that that sums it up. And and the only thing I would add to that would be the important aspect of how it affects a person with regards to their faith in the divine. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a believer can get a lot out of this in a reflective way Mm -hmm. because that's what it does for me. It makes me look in a mirror at the things that I've faced and how I've handled them and when I've lost hope and maybe where I could reconsider the the depth of what i've you know come up against and and how it's maybe not as bad as it seems and then i think for a person not of faith can just find this honestly just an inspirational tale of hope and and pushing through and fighting for what you know is right and justice and learning to show mercy ultimately and the satisfaction that comes with that as well. So there we go. Oh, that, that was perfectly said. And honestly, <laughs> okay. that, 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 that quote, that quote by, by Ebert, that was perfect. It was absolutely yeah, I mean, perfect. that's what I'm saying. Like he's so, <laughs> it's so hard to beat him. <laughs> it, it is. And I love that moment, you know, where, where he mentions it and he says, and, and they do it in under two hours. That's, <laughs> that's incredible. And, and honestly, you know, when you really do think about it, it is actually quite a feat that they pulled together that entire story, all of those uh, thematic elements, all of that, you know, the the deeper reflections and everything in that type of runtime. It, it, it goes to show the strength of the of the writing, I think, and the directing, you know, uh, you know, because because I never felt like it felt rushed at all, um, once, you know, no. at all, <laughs> you know. So now for our, our second uh, aspect of Under the Lens, this is going to be a fun one, I think, is uh, um, the actor MVP. So, you know, um, as we've talked about in this review, there was there was a lot of great performances. You know, um, I don't think that there was a bad performance uh, in this movie and there was a lot that that stood out. Uh, and so basically this this uh, section here can be, uh, you know, you can choose, you know, any any actor who was in it for any role. It doesn't matter if it was a lead, if it was a cameo, uh, whatever part you felt lifted the film up and uh, and added some some uh, meaning or some comedic or whatever moment you felt that uh, that added to the film. Well, I, I think it has 
to be Caviezel. Like, is I almost take him out of it because <laughs> I mean he's the lead and he mm-hmm. carries so much of the nuanced character. He's the character that changes, and so that's the difficult performance, right? Is like you have to go from a point A to a, an actual point B. No one else really has to go through that. <laughs> they pretty much are all staying the same. So I would say my favorite. I, I love I legitimately like what you just said is to me so true. I, I could pick anybody mm-hmm. and and feel kind of I mean Henry Cavill's like he's just there. It's mm-hmm. funny because he's baby Henry mm-hmm. Cavill, but like uh-huh. he's not he doesn't have anything to do, really. Mm-hmm. He's fine. But I, I think for me, Richard Harris stands out. And part of this is because I, I every time I, I cannot help but get, you know, relate to other roles. And so I keep thinking, I'm like, okay, so this should have been a lot easier. You have Dumbledore and Jesus mm-hmm. stuck in a tower, <laughs> like literally just apparate and, and get out. You know, you know, I can't help, but like put myself in Harry Potter world because <laughs> of this major role that Richard Harris is famous for uh, to me. But I think his value in his few scenes, and we've talked about it, you know, he's been the focus of multiple quotes already and points of the, he cr- helps to, usher in the change in Dante's that allows him to go from one guy into another guy. And because of that, I think he's just brilliant, absolutely brilliant and completely unself-serving, faithful, uh, and just amazing, amazingly grandpa like. And yet it's, um, it's incredible that he pulls it off because he is so elderly at this point. Mm -hmm. And yet, you believe with every fiber of your being that he would have survived this long and, and dug this tunnel out. He's, he's just so smart and, and faith faithful. Like I said, I, I just love everything about his performance. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I would agree. And actually, you know, he was going to be the one that I, I was going to choose as well. Cause like you said, I feel like you do have to kind of take a uh, Caviezel out of it a little bit just because, you know, he's in almost every scene of the movie, you know, he, he carries it with such weight and emotion and stuff. So I think, you know, that, that is the, the easy one to say, but yeah, I would definitely choose, you know, a uh, uh, Richard Harris as well, uh, you know, in his role, because it's such, as you said, it's such an important role because even though he's only in, you know, uh, you know, the prison sequence, you know, of, of this film, his presence is felt throughout the entire thing. You know, that, uh, you know, uh, his quote about, you know, not going down the path of vengeance, the the way that he teaches him and educates him. You feel that throughout all of the scenes and you even feel it a little bit towards the end in the final duel where uh, where Edmund actually spares uh, Fernand and he, he tells him, you know, consider this mercy and he's going to let him go, you know, um, you know, in, instead of instead of killing him. And uh, and thankfully, so that we could get a duel, he comes back. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, so I, I, I would agree with that. I think that uh, Richard Harris just he brought so much to that to that role and you know, it's like, like you said, you know, at, at that, at that age of an, as an actor, you know, he has nothing more to prove. <laughs> you know, he, he's, he's shown what a, what a fantastic thespian he is and everything. He could have totally phoned this in if he wanted to. And he didn't, he, he gave everything to it. And I think it was, it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic, um, acting job. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So uh, now this is uh, this is one that uh, um, I'm looking forward to because I'm excited to, to hear what your uh, choices are. I know I have uh, I have mine and this is a uh, top scenes. So this is basically, uh, you know, choosing what scenes you felt popped for you uh, in the uh, in the movie. And, you know, it can be one scene. It can be two. It can be three. Uh, you know, you, you get to choose uh, which ones you felt uh, stood out the most. Well, we've talked about quite a few of them, honestly, mm-hmm. um, already. I would add that I really enjoy the moment between Fernand and Edmund when they have their sword duel after mm-hmm. it's been re- revealed that he has betrayed him and Edmund is experiencing that classic feeling of you know, just hysteria and he's lost and confused and doesn't understand what is happening. And Fernand, after they duel quickly before he leaves, just picks up this chess piece and says to remember better days. Mm. And it stuck with me that he was doing this and I I didn't place it immediately. I actually had to stop and go back 
and kind of try and remember wh what was the purpose of that? Did I miss something? And I did. It's because Napoleon Bonaparte told them we are kings or pawns. Mm -hmm. And so he was referencing that moment earlier in the film from them and that quote mm -hmm. and basically saying, remember when we were, you know, both kings, but obviously now I am. And mm -hmm. therefore, <laughs> therefore you're essentially going to be a pawn. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just a, a moment that showed both the, the awful, awful deep down nature of Fernand, but also slightly maybe a bit of remorse at the same time. Um, so I really liked that. I also really enjoy the knife fight scene with Jacopo when he <laughs> great. Uh -huh. it, it, it feels like it comes out of nowhere, man. And mm -hmm. I honestly I think in a lot of movies this would not work. It would be a tone shift that I would roll my eyes at. But for some reason in a swashbuckling film, it feels right. Same thing with pirates. Pirates does similar, like kind of jokey moments that follow up very serious story, story beats mm -hmm. and it just works. But it, it's so much fun. The way that this whole interaction goes, um, the fact that, you know, he gets a name. What does it mean? Driftwood. <laughs> and you know, it's just, it's such a, an awesome thing. Like I, I remember when I watched it that first time, couple years ago, not most recently for the podcast mm -hmm. um, prep, but it took me a minute when I saw Guzman show up, I was like, okay, what, you know, like this guy does not fit in this movie, yeah. <laughs> but everything about this scene sets the stage for who he's going to become in his life and the importance of him. And I, so I just, I think it's a great introductory moment and I love there's a line in the movie when he and Mercedes um, are able to get back together uh, at the, the dance or whatever it is. When they see each other, you can tell that she recognizes him immediately. And it's right after we find out that she has married Fernand because she was pregnant mm -hmm. with Edmund's son. And there's just a, a brilliant line of dialogue when Edmund is, you know, the count and he's with Fernand and he says, may I steal your wife? And he pauses. <laughs> there's a pause. Mm -hmm. And then he goes for the waltz. And I just, oh my gosh, it was just like, I, I'm all about like that sort of type of, I don't know, that kind of dig and, and just like under the skin, even you know, unknown to Fernand that he's even, he's not, he doesn't even realize what he's being, what's being said to him and how it relates. But I just, I loved it mm -hmm. so much. I thought that was uh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is another piece of dialogue. It's mm -hmm. when he's with Mercedes and again, and she reveals that she has been wearing this string engagement ring around her finger mm -hmm. for 16 years. Mm. beautiful representation, completely unrealistic. There's no mm. freaking way. <laughs> Absolutely. Part of my brain was breaking going, come on, come on. You like went back in the backyard and just put that on your finger. Ten yeah. <laughs> but I, I love the symbolism of it. Cause I just, that stuff gets to my heart and she is appealing to him. And she's like, let go of your hate. <laughs> Sounds like a Star Wars mm -hmm. quote. Um, <laughs> and she's saying, you know, take the escape that God has offered you. He has given us the opportunity for you to put this behind you. And Enman says, can I not escape him? And he's mm -hmm. talking about God. He is still trying to push back. And she says, no, he is in everything, even in a kiss. And I just, I again, I just, I love the beauty of the dialogue and the the picture it paints of faith and relationship and love. And, and she's kind of echoing, she's very much following up with the same kind of perspective that Abby Ferrara would have had. Uh, and so I, I just, I just think that was a really important scene that, that moved me. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, those are all, all fantastic scenes, you know, cause the, you know, the, the movie is just like chock full, full of great moments I think like, um, you know, definitely, I would say like a few that, that stood, that stood out to me, uh, you know, there was, um, there was one, it was, uh, 
it was, I can't remember the exact moment, but it was, uh, it was between, uh, Caviezel and, and Richard Harris and it was in the prison. And, uh, and it was just this kind of like, it was a moment of like humor, but also like hopelessness. And it was basically where, where it was a bit of dialogue where Edmund says that there are 72,519 stones in my walls. I've counted them many times. And then I love how Ferreira then replies and says, but have you named them yet? Yes. And, <laughs> and, it's, and it's, it's a great, it's just, it's a, it's a really funny moment. You know, it's the one I, la- I laughed at and stuff, but, but I also loved just the, the kind of, juxtaposing of, of 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 kind of humor and hopelessness also you know that that Frey had been exactly where Edmund had been and that you know that that you know right after he he says that Edmund starts crying and he says you know don't worry it'll pass I promise you and it was just a great interaction I felt between these two characters who who are just experiencing just a living hell basically. And just like how, how they're able to get through it. That was, that was a scene I really, I really liked. I thought it was just very well done. Um, then a scene that I absolutely love. And this is just uh, one is, uh, is I love the balloon entrance uh, moment. Yes. You know, it, it is just it's out it of is, a Baz oh, Luhrmann. It's, it's, it almost oh, like it reminds me of mm-hmm. the great Gatsby. I was like, yeah, it's, oh, it's, he's a yes. great Gatsby. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, <laughs> it is, it is so, you know, it's just, you know, it's this extravagant moment of, of wealth and that you see, you know, all of the, the, the elite of Paris, you know, and then, you know, I love that there's just this silent moment, you know, and then you see the balloon coming with the fireworks mm-hmm. and then just that magnificent soundtrack of the chorus behind and just, you know, and then just the the moment, you know, where he steps out and he's just walking in the slight slow motion with his coat blowing. Oh, it's just magnificent. <laughs> you know, um, it was just it was just, you know, not only like you said, you know, was it just filmed gorgeously and just a, a, a fantastic moment? You know, I, I, I loved, you know, showing how I loved how it kind of showed almost you know, a little bit of how, how the, the, the wealthy and powerful feel basically that they have no idea that this is a guy who has no formal education, you know, who was, you know, somebody who worked on a ship, basically they were looking at him as, Oh my gosh, look at this amazingly powerful, wealthy man who we've never heard of. And we all want to be like him basically. And it was, and, it was, and just they don't so care. Good. It's, it's they a don't great care. representation mm-hmm. of the, the mm-hmm. whole problem with society is like mm-hmm. they, all they care is that he gave himself a name. He made it up. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'm the count of <laughs> this sandwich. I know it's not a sandwich. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an <laughs> Island. That's where the name came from. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm the count of this random Island. And because I have money and I can put on this lavish show, you believe me. And mm-hmm. and no one and I mean they do at some point, you know, Villafort and Fernando, they do question it a little bit. But the people, that's the that's the thing, is like he is able to gain the trust of the whole of society simply by making himself out of money. And and, and I think the film is critiquing that with mm-hmm. within the way it's showing it to us. Like mm-hmm. It's yeah, it's such a well structured and constructed uh, reveal moment. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And my the final scene that I would say that I liked, and it was one that just stood out. It's a very it's a very quick moment near the end, and it's it's right at the uh, at the end where uh, where Fernand uh, gets his fatal uh, stab wound from uh, from Edmond after their uh, after their duel, and. Um, and basically what ends up happening is he, you know, he realizes, you know, he's, he's mortally wounded and he looks at Edmund and he says, uh, what happened to your mercy? And Edmund replies, I'm a count, not a saint. And he's kind of a callback to, uh, to Ferreo where he says, uh, he says, uh, something similar. Um, I can't remember the exact, uh, the exact phrasing, but it's a, it's a similar, um, uh, uh, structured quote. And what I've thought was really interesting about about that moment that I really liked was I I thought it really showcased just who Fernand was as a person that that nothing in his life was ever his fault he blamed everyone for everything else that he was never responsible for anything you know that that we have the moment where Edmund gives him mercy and allows him to go back but his envy his jealousy his his anger you know at not wanting to be the penniless guy who has nothing and Edmund having everything causes him to go back to his death. But even at that moment where he's dying, 
he still does not realize this is my fault. I'm the one who did all of this. You know, I, I set in motion basically what resulted in my own death at the end of his life. He's still blaming somebody else for it. And I don't know. I thought it was, it was an interesting moment. I thought it was, it was, it was powerful. So that was one that I liked. Yeah. I mean, that whole scene is so well done too. It it bookends the beginning where he says, to, for, uh, to Edmund because you're the son of a clerk. He's like, why? He says, because you're the son of a clerk and I'm not supposed to want to be you. Mm-hmm. And then he, when they are about to have that sword fight, he says, you know, I cannot live in a world where you have everything and mm-hmm. I have nothing because he's basically given the opportunity to, to not do this. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he's, mm-hmm. it's a matter of status, wealth, you know, prestige. Like he simply cannot accept that his life is just enough. And that is juxtaposed the entire movie by the journey that Edmund goes on. And the fact, I mean, he he had everything taken away and he did find meaning in life and continuing on what, who's to say that Fernand couldn't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, It would have been looked different. Obviously (laughs) it would have been a very different world for him, but it's a tragedy that some people can't it, it shows you there's there's two two ways it could go you can either retain your faith and your hope and push through that and or you cannot and let it crush you and ultimately lead to your death mm-hmm no, absolutely. I think that that's a, a great thing that you that you bring up that, that, you know, that, yeah, he he could have gone out and found found redemption and found a new life if he wanted to, you know, because that is exactly what happened had happened with with Edmund and how even at the end, Edmund says that he realizes at the end when he's leaving, you know, Shadow D for the last time that he realizes that all of his wealth and all of that doesn't matter to him, you know, that, that he realizes that that's not what's important, his possessions and and what he's accumulated in his life. It's it's who he is as a person and, and the people around him. So, yeah, I think that's that's a, a great, a great, great moment. So now, you know, uh, uh, for our final uh, element in uh, Under the Lens, which is our uh, our grading of this film. Uh, now, um, you know, I, I have down, you know, because I do a, uh, a one to five star, um, but feel free to um, to use whatever uh, metric that you, you choose to use for uh, for your your reviews and your grading. Uh, how do you grade the Count of Monte Cristo? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, so on my scale, on my Ray ratings, you know, I, I do one through five, but I don't do half stars. I've done away with them because it forces me to make hard choices. <laughs> and this is one of, it doesn't actually happen that much anymore. Like I feel pretty confident that most things are a three because I like most movies and then mm-hmm. a four, you really, I really got to love you and want to rewatch you mm-hmm. to be a four. I got to think something's exceptional. And then a five is just, pretty darn rare now which is mm-hmm. what i i structured my ratings to be like mm-hmm. i this is a borderline five for me i mean it is it's a movie that i feel like if i was to watch it again it, it could get there i mm-hmm. i honestly <laughs> i struggle to figure out what it is that is keeping it from being a perfect movie to me <laughs> i if i can't pinpoint it out loud like it makes me wonder what it is that's holding me back i think maybe there's a little bit of the pacing for me mm-hmm. with once he's the count and mm-hmm. kind of between that and the end, I think it doesn't always have the propulsion that I want it to have. Uh, even though I like all the story beats, uh, that was another great scene. We didn't mention by the way, but that just real quickly, the, mm-hmm. the way he manipulates and sets up the son to be oh. fake kidnapped by his oh. pirate friends and the and his pirate his pirate yes. captain mm-hmm. walks out of the shed like you know it's them <laughs> no uh. one watching the movie doesn't think it's them but when he walks out of the shadow mm-hmm. with this like smirk on his face tossing <laughs> coin it's just oh it's so mm, like swashbuckle it's what you want out of this kind of movie that's absolutely it was a great it was, it was a crazy because like you said i knew from the moment he started fighting him that it was them yeah. but yeah that, that that reveal though like you said when he comes out of the shadows it's perfect it's, it really it's absolutely is. perfect <laughs> so i'm gonna cheat because i mm-hmm. i'm gonna go four and a half because this isn't my scale so i don't have to mm-hmm. portray to my own rules <laughs> I'm going to say four and a half and and break my own rules because that's kind of really how I feel right now. Like it is right on the verge of being Mm -hmm. uh, an all-time favorite. Maybe when I buy that Blu-ray that you send me the link for and I dig it, (laughs) Uh because that's what usually happens. When I know the history of a movie and I love, 
love, love, love behind the scenes and making of documentaries on films. I just, it always elevates a movie for me. Maybe that'll push it over the top, Mm -hmm. but so I'll go four and a half for now. Okay. So I, I ended up giving it uh looking at my, my letterbox here. Uh, cause I haven't written my review yet of it. Um, that'll probably be coming in the next few days, but yeah, I, I, uh, I, I do give, uh, half stars, uh, for my, for my movies. Um, and so I ended up, uh, I ended up, I gave this one a four and a half, uh, as well. Um, it was very, very close to what you said for me of, of like the perfect movie of a five. It was extremely close, uh, you know, cause it's definitely going to be a movie I rewatch, you know, for the rest of my life. Um, you know, and, uh, definitely a movie that I share with people and such. And I, I feel like, you know, there was just a few minor moments that kind of lowered it to lowered it down from a five. Like you said, on further rewatches, you know, over the years, it might go up to a five for me. Um, but I was the same way as you with like the pacing a little bit that there was, um, I want to say, I believe it was, between the second and the third act, I want to say leading into the final, uh, you know, like basically when, when he's carrying out his revenge against everybody, yep. uh, that I felt like there was a few moments of that where it felt a little rushed, you know, because the, up until that point, the first two acts, the film was very well paced and it was very much just, it was taking its time setting everything up. And then it kind of sped up a little bit right at the end that it kind of felt like maybe, you know, I don't know. I don't know if maybe there was a, you know, where they, they asked, you know, Disney might've asked for, you know, for a certain runtime or something. I'm not sure. Um, so like, I feel like maybe if the film would have had an extra 10 minutes of padding, maybe, or an extra 15 minutes, I think it probably would have easily been a five star for me. Um, but just so for, for right now, I, I give it that, that four and a half, but by no means do I consider, you know, do I consider that, that pacing to, to greatly hurt the movie at all? I think, I think it's still magnificent and, and I think it's still, you know, it's still a very, very, very near perfection, <laughs> very near. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, so so moving into uh, into final thoughts here. Uh, what are your final thoughts on this on this film? I watch it. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't know that I have too much more. Honestly, mm-hmm. that we haven't covered. I mm-hmm. I just think it really is fantastic. And if you haven't seen it, so if you're in the thirties, forties age range, which I am, and you haven't watched it since you were a teenager, or if you're younger and you came around after this movie's heyday and you haven't gone back and watched any of these old Kevin Reynolds swashbucklers like this or Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, like I go check these movies out because they really are a lot of fun. And I would throw some of the other ones in there that are not as good as this, but like the man in the iron mask, which is a Leonardo DiCaprio movie. Um, you've got the three Musketeers, which is a fun swashbuckling adventure movie. There are movies like this that I just don't think that they get talked about or mentioned enough because Hollywood doesn't make things like this very often anymore for us. It, I, I can't remember really the last time we got something like this outside of like a pirate sequel. And so I, I think there is such a place for this in the cinematic world and i would love people to uh, help bring it back so go watch this talk about it share it show it some love but i yeah i think it's just such an underrated great movie and definitely and i i echo aaron when i say you know definitely go 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 watch the movie it's it's one you will not be disappointed in you're gonna have a great time it's a it's it's it challenges you to think a little bit deeper, but it also gives you that popcorn uh, excitement, you know, uh, that you get from watching like other movies. Um, so so definitely definitely check it out, and you know it it really it really f- is a great rend I don't want to say rendition, but it's a great ode to you know the swashbuckler films of old. You know, it's like you know I grew up watching a lot of, you know, like black and white, you know, uh, movies and like pirate Mm -hmm. movies from the, from, you know, the thirties and forties. And, you know, this reminded me of those in all the best ways, you know, it's like, I I adored, you know, Errol Flynn's, you know, Captain Blood, the Seahawk, you know, like, you know, all, all those, those great movies that had the revenge, the sword fighting. It was just, it was just awesome. And, and you could clearly tell that the screenwriter had a love for that genre as well, because he poured all of that love into into this movie. 
And, uh, you know, and we don't, we don't get a lot of swashbucklers anymore. You know, there's, there's, you know, they still exist every now and then, but, uh, but, you know, um, outside of, you know, the pirates franchise, as you said, you know, we really haven't had, you know, a movie of this quality, you know, that, that really harkens back to that, that golden age of, of, uh, of Hollywood swashbucklers. So, um, so definitely, you know, after you watch this one, go check out some of those, some of those older ones, you know, with Errol Flynn and some of those other ones, oh, yes. because I think, you know, you'll have a great time with them. And, and honestly, uh, uh, Aaron, I'm so glad that you brought up the Three Musketeers. Uh, you know, because Oliver that Platt, is yeah, uh, <laughs> Kiefer Sutherland. I mean, oh. come on, it's it's mm-hmm. a classic. It is a classic, and uh, I actually had revisited that one uh, back. Uh, I want to say it was um, right at the beginning of the pandemic because I was working from home, and so I was watching a lot of movies as I was working. <laughs> you know, it's like. You know, I was just had my laptop on the couch, you know, and uh, and, you know, and I would just have like a movie going and I'd remembered seeing this one as a kid. And so I turned it on, you know, and then I ended up having to like I ended up stopping it because I was like, OK, I want to actually devote more attention to this. <laughs> you know, um, And yeah, it's just a great movie. So that's another one, you know, uh, guys, definitely, definitely check out. Uh, it's a criminally underrated uh, swashbuckler film. Um so, uh, so yeah, so, you know, that, that brings us to, uh, to the end of our review of, uh, the Count of Monte Cristo. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it and, uh, you know, uh, feel free to, uh, you know, check out, uh, other episodes, um, that we have of Under the Lens. Uh, we have a bunch of reviews, uh, we have interviews, uh, you know, it's, um, a lot of different, uh, different flavors for whatever you may enjoy, uh, you know, you can uh, check us out on um, all of the major uh, all of the major podcast platforms. We're on all of them. Uh, you can also check out uh, my Twitter account uh, at Byron Lafayette. I, I use it semi frequently. Uh, I'm also on uh, Vero um, uh, at Byron Lafayette, and uh, also very active on uh, on Facebook. Uh, so, you know, if you want to uh, to interact with me, that's probably the best the best place to. Um, and uh, you can also check out uh, if you are listening to this and you're a, a fellow film critic, uh, feel free to check out the uh, uh, Independent Film Critics of America. Um, it's a relatively new uh, uh, critics association that um, I actually uh, started um, and uh, we're growing fairly quickly. Uh, we have a lot of uh, great people. Uh, Aaron is a member um, as well as um, mm-hmm. a lot of others. So uh, definitely uh, feel free to check that out. And uh, like I said, if you're a film critic and uh, you want to submit an application, uh, the requirements and uh, and uh, guidelines are right there on the website at uh, IndieCriticsOfAmerica.org. Uh, so, uh, so Aaron, where can uh, people find you? Where can people listen to your podcast? Where, where can they uh, get a hold of you? Well, I'm fairly easy to find. The, the podcast is fairly easy to find under Feelin' Film, luckily. I magically discovered a name that worked for me or worked for us, I should say, six years ago. And uh, it's Phelan, F-E-E-L-I-N apostrophe uh, film. And we have been around long enough that now you put that into a search engine in Google and and our stuff's going to come up first, which is everybody's dream for (laughs) SEO. But you can find me personally uh, at Aaron L. White. That's my username pretty much everywhere. A-A-R-O-N-E-L-W-H-I-T-E on Twitter, on Facebook. There's a Feel and Film Facebook discussion group. Would love to have people come join there. You can find that uh, in my links all over the place as well. That's my Instagram. It's my gaming system handle like it's my letterbox username so you can find me everywhere using that excellent and yeah and definitely everyone check out the uh, the feeling film uh podcast and also uh, check out the the facebook group uh it's a lot of fun i've been a member of it for i want to say going on probably three years now and just you know i've had some fantastic conversations about film and uh you know had some had some great debates and there's a lot of great people in that group so uh so definitely definitely check that out um well, guys, you know, um, as I said, that concludes uh, this wonderful discussion that we had on the Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, I'm so glad that you all uh, joined us on uh, Under the Lens. Thank you for tuning in. I uh, hope you have a wonderful day, and uh, I can't wait to see you all uh, on the next episode.